I first started looking into um, compulsive shopping or shopping addiction, buying addiction, oniomania. They're all the same, um, same names of the same thing. I first started looking into it as a side thing while my postdoc was on hold, <laughs> actually, at Stanford. Um, I was doing, oh, sorry, thanks. I was doing um, brain imaging research there as a postdoc, and my project was on hold. Meanwhile, the person I was working with, Larry Coran, um, was asked if he thought shopping addiction was a real thing, and he said, I don't know, let's go on the radio and mention, you know, call in if you feel like you have a shopping addiction, we'll see who responds. So he just went on KGO, and we had over 500 callers identifying themselves as somebody with a shopping addiction or shopping compulsion and needing help with it. So while my project was on hold, I called back <laughs> those callers and talked to them um, to see, you know, to try to sort out what, what is this? You know, is this a, a real thing or is this, you know, a symptom of, of mania that some people have or something? <clears throat> and what I found was, first of all, the stories were really amazing. Um, I was talking to people who were educated, you know, high functioning, people who had a lot of shame and awareness about what they were doing, but still an inability to stop. Right up here. Okay. Uh -huh. <coughs> Thanks. And so this, this was very interesting to me. Why does a, you know, a well-educated person with a lot of insight keep doing what they're doing when it's so devastatingly damaging to their marriages, to their financial life? Um, and so then I really started linking this with addiction and thinking, yeah, this is, these people are addicted to something. This really sounds like an addiction. So my interests got sidetracked onto shopping addiction <laughs> instead of MRI research. Um, and I've been looking at it, uh, into it since then. That was back in um, 1998. And now I've been looking into it since then, and there's a lot more um, that's come to light about tricks in marketing and about um, the research in, in compulsive shopping, who's doing it and what exactly they're doing. So I'm happy to share some of this information with you. <clears throat> this is the definition that has been used in most research studies for shopping addiction. Um, and I also have a picture of Cookie Monster there with a <laughs> saying, I wish I knew how to quit you. Because asking somebody with a shopping addiction to stop shopping is like asking Cookie Monster to stop eating cookies, right? It's like impossible. They're, he's made for cookies. He's all about cookies. There's nothing else to him. And that's what it felt like when I was talking to these people on the phone originally, too. The man who bought, yeah? I can't hear you. Oh, you can't hear me? OK. Is, does this, is this better? It <laughs> feels like I'm sticking it actually in my mouth, but all. The mic is all the way up, so you need to speak loudly. OK, I'll speak loudly. Thanks. Sorry about that. Um, so this is the definition that um, is used in most studies for shopping addiction. It's um, a preoccupation with or inability to resist urges to shop or buy. It doesn't have to be buying. It could just be shopping without spending, um, which is excessive in time or in the amount spent um, and persists despite, despite um, dis distress and, and disruption in role functioning. Here's um, information from a study that's done more recently, and it's kind of interesting. In the original um, research, not only that first um, you know, radio thing, but in other research studies, we were looking at people who self-identified as compulsive shoppers, and that group was um, mostly women, 98% women, and mostly over 45. But what uh, they did in a more recent study, and a larger um, cross-country study, a large phone survey with 2,500 participants is that they didn't use the term compulsive shopping and ask people to self-identify. They used uh, criteria, behaviors that we see compulsive shoppers do and asked people if they do those. And what they found is that there's an equal amount of men and women that compulsively shop. The women are self-identifying as compulsive shoppers and looking for help with it. The men weren't identifying with that label but the men were endorsing the behaviors at the same rate as women. So about 6% of that general cross-country sample um, were falling into the um, category of compulsive shopping. It crossed all levels of income, 
um, it had a huge age range, so it wasn't just limited to women over 45. This was, um, you know, I think teenagers were doing so somebody, uh, young adults were doing it, <coughs> older adults were doing it, and um, these comorbidity studies at the bottom. That information is from the original research before 2000, the 2006 study. So unfortunately, these statistics, the comorbidity statistics, are based on the women over 45. <laughs> But um, even from that, you know, they need to be redone with the, with the new wider population. But even with that, we can see there's a huge 45% um, overlap with alcohol abuse, 20% um, with eating disorders, 20% with other impulse control disorders, and with OCD. So if you have somebody in your practice who has alcohol um, issues or eating issues or impulse control or OCD, there's a, a very large chance that at some point they're going to run into a shopping issue too. Um, here's some similarities between compulsive shopping and addictions. It's not officially categorized as an addiction in the DSM-4. It's coded as impulse control disorder NOS um, and it doesn't look like it's going to get moved into the addictions category for DSM-5 even though gambling is and it's very very similar to compulsive gambling. Um, but in both, you see a persistence despite huge negative consequences, and that was what was really noticeable to me even right away talking to people. Um, a loss of control, buying more than they intended, cognitive narrowing, that's when they see the shoes <laughs> or whatever it is. They find the deal online that they've been looking for that was an unbelievable um, couldn't pass it up and all they see is themselves and that desired object and all awareness kind of falls away. That's the cognitive narrowing that occurs. Um, there's no other comparable high to them so this becomes really the only source of um, feeling good, feeling capable or feeling um, that good. Um, you see tolerance and withdrawal. People need um, to buy more to get the same kind of high feeling. There's an anticipatory high, that's a big one, on the way to the mall, looking through things online. Um, and there's seeking power, emotional escape, or numbing out. And then there's a crash afterwards, which is really one of the, the telltale signs if somebody's got a shopping addiction, is that after they buy, they fall into a depression or shame or hiding about it. So there's lots of similarities between addictions and compulsive shopping. Um, I'm going to go through these kind of quickly. Hoarding <coughs> is different than compulsive shopping. Not, all, not everybody who compulsively shops hoards. This is a picture um, from that show Hoarding from their website. And you can see hoarders tend to keep things they come by naturally. Um, they're not going out and shopping usually for them. And they're keeping it in a, in a very disorganized state and you don't see those things. In compulsive shoppers, usually there's a very high degree of organization. I'll give you an example of that in a minute. And also, they're going out to buy and shop for things. They're not just keeping what they have. Um, here's another example from the hoarding website. And this person, you know, if they've gone out and ordered all these books, and I'm thinking about all the books that I've just ordered <laughs> on Amazon <laughs> with the free shipping ad they had. Um, <coughs> but if they've gone out and bought all these in a you know, short amount of time, then there could be a buying issue. But if these are all the books that they've just accumulated across their lifetime and never gotten rid of or organized, then that's more of a hoarding issue rather than a shopping issue. Um, and mania. Also, um, a compulsive shopping is a symptom of mania sometimes, but when it's a <laughs> symptom of mania, it happens during a manic episode, and you have all of those other symptoms while um, uh, compulsive shoppers are usually doing their shopping to escape a negative mood state. Um, <coughs> this one's a movie, and I'm going to... I guess we can look at this, because this is a really good example of um, the high degree of organization in a compulsive shopper, as opposed to the disorganized state you see in hoarders. This is from a show it's great these shows are on and I don't have to ask my clients for permissions to <laughs> come to their house and take pictures. Um, this is from a show called Extreme Couponing, which is a fabulous example of compulsive shopping. Some of these stories are amazing. 
Um, but take a, take a look at her organization. Hold on a second. You can't hear you can't hear that, can you? Oh, that's a good idea. Find forums where coupons can share deal information and print coupons. I started online <laughs> to see what I can find. Any new deals pop up if anybody found anything else. Then it's off to the store, but she's not buying anything just yet. First, she has to look for the best in-store deals. I will spend time and walk through both the grocery stores I shop at and both the pharmacies I go to. Monday, I spend six hours walking around, writing everything down. So after I get done with the walk around at the store, I come home, do a coupon matchup, then I order coupons. I do not buy newspapers. Amanda buys her coupons from online clipping services, who for a handling fee clip and mail coupons to shoppers. And she's ordered about a thousand for today's trip at a cost of around $70. I've made out a really detailed list. This is definitely going to be one of the biggest hauls I've ever done. With her list, her coupons, and her whole day off from work set aside to shop, Amanda heads to the grocery store. When you walk into the store, it's like pre-game goes into I'm showing up to play. Today, I'm going to be looking at getting some quick meal type things that are on sale, some other items that are going to be good for lunches. I guess just start grabbing for fella. How many of these are we getting again? About 125 of each. Alrighty. 20 of those, 20 of those. We had a cart issue. Oh, we're gonna get another one. Next on our list is candy, 150 bars. 64, With a two for a dollar store sale stacked with a dollar off two coupon. She's getting it all totally free. I lost count, so I lost only two. We're gonna have to read calories. I have to read calories. I'm six, eight, four, one. You already counted one. So I got four. Okay, so you got You already counted one of these. And you slept. Okay. Now, yes, you do. Four, eight, ten, four. Let's quickly stop when it comes to my shopping. I need to be in complete control. I need to know what's going on, where it's going. I need to have control over everything. One, two, one. We're on our seventh race card, and we're not done yet. Good deal. With her fleet of nine cards full, Amanda is ready for checkout. We're ready to start checking out. All right, um, we got nine cards. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We got to call moving truck. <laughs> so there's a great example of compulsive shopping. In this, um, in this instance, there's no money spent, right? She ended up getting the, the nine cards for something like $30. And in a lot of these, episodes you see somebody get some, some haul like that um, and they'll get $60 back or something like that because of the way they work the coupons. So it's not necessarily about money, but it could be about time spent and the amount of, um, the degree of absorption. She's taking time off work, she's involving her whole family, she's spending hours and hours researching <coughs> what's going on sale when, how to get the right coupons. Um, so there's a lot of time and obsession going into this. You saw hyperstimulation. You saw um, control issues. You see a lot of similarities to addiction there. Um, <coughs> here's some measures that I can, I can sort of skip through, um, and I'll give you copies of the measures if you're interested. I can send you those. The Y box shopping version is something that's based on the Y box for OC OCD. Um, <coughs> and it just basically asks, uh, there's an obsession scale about thoughts about shopping the compulsion scale about the actual behaviors of shopping. And the questions are about how much time it occupies, how much does it interfere in your other behaviors, um, how able are you to resist it. Um, the, the more thorough measure, and this is the one they used in that 2006 study where they didn't call it compulsive shopping, but they asked people these questions to see um, who actually compulsive shopped, and they saw equal numbers in men and women. Um, and 6% of the population, this is the scale they use, the compulsive buying scale. 
and I have some abbreviations of the questions on there. They're more specific about um, what shoppers do. Uh, for instance, I feel I must spend leftover money, um, agree strongly or disagree strongly, or anything in between. Um, I think others would be horrified if they knew about my shopping behavior. I bought things I couldn't afford. I wrote a check when I knew I didn't have funds to cover it. Um, I bought something to make myself feel better. That's something we all do, right? But how often and to what degree and in the context of the rest of this um, paints, a, paints a different picture. Um, I feel anxious on days I can't shop um, and I make only minimum payments on my credit card. So that's, that's an example of the more specific questions about um, what compulsive shoppers do. In the 2006 study where they used that, they um, compiled a list of the behaviors that compulsive shoppers were more likely doing than non-compulsive shoppers. So the 6% of people they found um, were making senseless or impulsive purchases more often, um, were having out of control buying binges, were taking greater pleasure in shopping or buying, um, or feeling depressed after buying. That was not you know, what the non-compulsive shoppers were doing. They are paying the minimum on their credit cards, and they were having maxed out credit cards. I've also, um, so I've been skipping through it, but I've got pictures on here of ads that my um, group members have brought me of things they find um, irresistible. <coughs> so we've skipped some of those already. but. On this slide, there's um, some quilting advertisements, some quilting magazines that have um, pretty much every project circled and highlighted. This person was buying quilting supplies, and then once she'd get the supplies, she'd pack them away and lose interest, mm -hmm. and then go buy another one that she, she was fascinated with. So it was about acquiring stuff for new projects, not about owning or making the projects. And the other one is a, a Buddha made out of jewelry. And that was uh, from somebody who was um, addicted to buying gold and jade and found it irresistible. Um, <clears throat> this I'll mention quickly because it's a question that has come up a lot when I talk to people about compulsive shopping. How does shopping change in a recession? Do people do less of it? It turns out they don't do less of it, but um, what they buy is different. <coughs> There's something economists know about um, a reliable phenomenon that economists know called the lipstick index. When the rest of the economy tanks, lipstick sales go up. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a reliable phenomenon, and, and um, apparently all the way back to the Great Depression when movie ticket sales went up, when everything else went down. So apparently lipstick has been the thing that's been identified as a, um, a less expensive way to treat yourself, and it's not the higher brands, it's the department store brands. Maybelline is the outseller by a lot. Um, and interestingly, this year, um, the, Rev, the CEO of Revlon, I'm blanking on his name, he coined the lipstick index phrase. He said this year it's been about nail polish instead. But he said it's never really been specifically about lipstick, but it's about some appearance enhancing product that's easy to get. Um, <clears throat> this is another movie. I'm not sure if we have time for this one. It's a couple of minutes, but this is also from the same extreme couponing called Six Figure Stockpile. It's a guy giving a tour of his basement where he's stockpiled <clears throat> an amazing amount of stuff. Um, people tend not to use their stockpiles. They're showpieces. And they're a symbol of having outsmarted the big guy, sort of. You know, some people give stuff even to um, they donate it, um, but they're not going to donate it out of their stockpile. So no matter how huge their stockpile is, and this guy's stockpile is huge, it says he has, um, I think it said 60 pounds of frozen cheese is my favorite <laughs> stockpile. Um, the frozen chicken, he's got food items, he's got grooming items, he's got, it looks like a department store, or it looks like a grocery store in his basement. Um, <clears throat> but people don't use their stockpiles, they don't, give, no matter how big their stockpile gets, they're still bringing in new hauls. And that's about the process addiction, right? It's an addiction to bringing in the new haul, to outsmarting the big guy again, to getting something for nothing. It's not about what they have already. And it's certainly not about what they're going to use, because there's no chance <laughs> that guy's going to use all that stuff. 
And if you think about it, there's got to be expiration dates on most of that, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's, not like, it's not like the world's best earthquake supply or anything, because in, in an earthquake, I don't know what's going to happen to that 60 pounds of frozen cheese, but I don't think it's going to be very useful. Um, so shopping becomes an addiction, um, the same way other things become addictions. First of all, we're out of balance, and all of us are out of balance, overstressed, um, and needing some kind of escape. Second of all, shopping becomes hyper-stimulating, and there's a couple of ways that happens. Let me show you. This is a list um, that the very first compulsive shopping group I did came up with. Um, and it's about what um, they get from shopping that they don't get anywhere else. Um, shopping is for some the only source of social interaction. And that is usually with the salespeople. Um, there's also Nordstrom's fashion parties. I don't know if you've heard of those, like fashion night out, where they, um, they know um, through their own marketing research that there's a certain amount of their population of their shoppers who have um, recently let their kids you know, off to college, have a little bit of extra time, a little bit of extra money, and have been very self-sacrificing for the last 18 years <laughs> and are ready to do something for themselves. <clears throat> so they put on these parties where they have free cocktails, they have free massages, they treat you right, finally, after 18 years of not being treated right, right? and they sell you things. Um, it can be the only source of praise for some people, and that is, again, from the salespeople. Um, a source of completeness can come from owning the collections of things. You know, if you see the best coach bag you've ever seen in red, <laughs> You know, it's even better to have it in the brown and the black and the white version, too. So collections um, give people a sense of completeness. Um, it can be the only source of excitement, feeling clever for finding a bargain, for finding the, you know, the Louis Vuitton scarf in the bargain bin that was accidentally placed there or maybe not accidentally placed there. Um, the only source of feeling empowered with a credit card, able to get what they want feeling accomplished, having put together an outfit, or having found the best red sweater after searching through 10 different stores and making an Excel spreadsheet of all the red sweaters <laughs> <laughs> and all the benefits and picking the best one. Um, the only source of um, a me time um, or escape or even comfort. I think I just got my five minute warning, is that right? That could be. Okay, so let me skip through. Here's some other ways it becomes hyper-stimulating. Um, and these are just pictures from ads. Um, they're looking for, you know, attaching. This is the way um, hyper, sorry, shopping becomes hyper-stimulating uh, from the ads also. They're locking on to what our goals are and allying themselves with us, making us feel like they're like-minded, they understand what we need. Um, here's the Muno, if you have a toddler like I do, you know who that red guy Muno is, sticking out of the kind of a car you wished you never had to buy. <laughs> Not a cool car, but a minivan or a kid, you know, something to carry your kids in. <clears throat> they know that that cohort of people want to be cool or want to have fun. So in that ad, Muno and Soft Monkey get tattoos and go to a rave. Um, the bottom one is Bob Dylan selling Cadillacs. So there's a certain, you know, core of our population who, you know, a large cohort who still regard Bob Dylan as a real social leader, as an, you know, a person to listen to. And he says on this, um, everybody needs an adventurous detour. And a lot of people feel that, especially in a downturned economy. He's just attaching Cadillac to that. Um, let me get over to, sorry, this is about how much more accessible uh, shopping has become with handheld devices and online shopping. And the gist of this chart is that, um, this is from last year, at least 67% of shoppers from this uh, research place called Shopper Track, which is a terrifying, <laughs> terrifying account of keeping track of what shoppers do. At least 67% last year were using their smartphones um, to, do, to help them with their shopping. So they're accessing shopping 
a lot more often, a lot more easily. And that's also part of what makes something addictive, is having a lot of easy access to it. Neuromarketing is another way um, ads have become more powerful in making things hyper-stimulating or in triggering impulsive behavior where it wouldn't otherwise be. Um, <clears throat> I'll give you, since we're running out of time, um, I'll give you one example of the touch on the shoulder, and that's from a, a University of Columbia study, showed that um, if a person is given an option of $50 just for free, or a gambling situation where they could lose everything and have nothing, or they might win $100. Um, if they were tapped lightly on the shoulder right before they choose, they were 50% um, more likely to take the gambling option. And that's tapped lightly on the shoulder by a woman, no matter uh, what gender or orientation the, the subject was in. So the next time you're in a store and somebody touches you lightly on the shoulder and says, can I get you a dressing room? <laughs> Right? You know that there's market research involved in why they're touching you on the shoulder when they ask you that, and who is hired to touch you on the shoulder. So this is one example of um, a field called neuromarketing where they use research and brain science to figure out how to trigger desire in you or trigger impulsivity in you. Um, and there's a lot of examples of that. Here's just one more piece. Um, Markers know that women tend to buy things shaped like women. So the mustard with the nice waistline outsells the other mustard. <coughs> um, so people get addiction. This is a, a process addiction. And that means um, it's not about acquiring the things that they're buying, but it's about this, the moment of acquiring it. It's not about owning it uh, or having it. It's about seeking it or the moment of acquiring it. So the wish is not fulfilled by owning the object. It's the process of shopping or the moment of acquisition, the thrill of the chase, the meaning or the fantasy or the wish we're buying into. And these are some more pictures that I'll um, skip through so I can get to treatment. Um, see, there's one more thing I want to show you with the I put it in the wrong order. This is something on YouTube, and I don't know if you've seen this community or not. It's, um, there's a community of compulsive shoppers who post, um, post uh, tours of their hauls on YouTube. It's called um, I'm a Shopping Addict New Haul Jewelry, or I'm a Shopping Addict New Haul Clothes. Um, and if you Google that, on, or if you search for that on YouTube, you'll find hundreds and hundreds of people who videotape themselves, like this lady did, showing you what they bought because they have nobody else that they can show because of the consequences of their buying. But they have a support community where they make this tape and post it and then people comment on it. You really got the bargain. You know, you got the best shoes I've ever seen. Good for you. So it's a support community for compulsive shoppers. And there's just hundreds. I mean, it's just an endless list of these. They're all called I'm a Shopping Addict New Hall and then whatever the content is. Um, so assessing readiness, I put that in there as an example of somebody who's not ready, maybe, <laughs> because there's, there's support in there, they're you know, able to continue it. If they're not ready, then you're gonna stick with your motivational interviewing, of course, and, and family interviews. Um, but once they're ready to take a look at their shopping behavior, um, I always start with behavioral interventions. Since this is a behavioral problem, it builds, um, builds confidence in the therapy if they can see that they can really make changes quickly. So monitoring is actually a huge um, thing. A lot of compulsive shoppers don't keep track of what they're spending. So just having them write it down and maybe just say it to me is a big deal. See how much is actually going out the window and when it's happening. And it actually can lead to you finding out what are the high-risk times of day or high-risk places. When I did my first group at Stanford, um, my office happened to be across the street from the Stanford Mall. And so we'd have, I had these um, monitoring charts. This is a monitoring chart from my group. So it's you know, divided up by days of the week, and so I can see what days they're spending and how much they're spending, and everybody was spending on 
Wednesdays. So I thought, why, why is every one of these charts we're putting up here, like there's an episode on Wednesdays, and it turns out that on the way out of the parking lot, they were all stopping in the mall. <laughs> so we had to do an intervention of having them follow each other in their cars, like a little convoy, and not break the line. Um, <laughs> Uh, but the, this uh, modern form is really simple, and there's uh, many more complex ones that you can find. But I, um, what I do on here is, first of all, keep track of spending, how much and when. I um, separate urge and control, because I think those are separate phenomena. Um, they can have high urge days and high control days where they don't buy, but those aren't going to last long. If they have high urges, the high control is going to run out, right? So <clears throat> I want to look at what's happening with their urges and with their control. And there's also um, at the bottom keeping track of other things that they're trying to do to solve the problem or to stay um, you know, in good self-care. And a lot of them were doing things that theoretically should have been fun that weren't really. So we try to you know, get a language for emotions going and also get some real self-care going. And here's another, um, sorry, another one of the behavioral interventions I used when I started is um, having a card, a mini version of this one that sticks to a credit card and a checkbook that they have to answer the questions on first before they can peel it off and use it in a store. That doesn't work for online shopping because the credit card's already in there. <laughs> and all they have to do is click buy, you know, um, and they don't have to do that. So to do it other ways, but um, the, the point of this was to intervene in the cognitive narrowing to get them to think about, to remember what they already know about consequences before they actually um, complete the impulsive action. This is a, uh, a longer version that we were using in the group. So um, this person was buying sports equipment. She was getting bored at the... Um, hockey games she was dragged to with her family. So she would wander off and buy one of everything they had in the <laughs> sales kiosk every time. <clears throat> and she was also collecting um, collections of coach things um, to make her feel put together as a mom of three um, special needs kids. She was you know, wanting to feel put together, wanting to feel in control. Um, and this is early on, so her alternative behaviors She's just sort of writing question marks in there. <laughs> so throughout the group, we talk about what the, um, what the feelings are when she's wanting to buy. Um, and the feelings come up more once you stop the behavior. Then you'll have the feelings sort of flooding in. Um, and then rem like a little prompt, how would buying hurt? Try to remember what you already know about consequences and um, suggest some alternatives to buying. Um, so compulsive and impulsive, that's sort of a big topic, and since I probably have one minute, I'm going to pass by it. DVT strategies, anybody who works with addiction is probably familiar with these to <coughs> distress tolerance. All of these are very helpful for stopping a person from seeking the quick fixes, which are always maladaptive, quick fixes in shopping or drugs or alcohol. Um, so learning how to tolerate a distressed mood is a big one. Um, emotion regulation, that means how to change from a terrible mood into a better mood, how to have control over that. Um, and wise mind decision making, this is, I always talk about this with my clients and my groups, the urge surfing, um, <coughs> originally meant for, uh, well it's part of DBT, but it's also used in um, overeating too, that um, the curve of an urge looks like this, there's a peak where it becomes irresistible, but it's only a momentary peak. And if you can surf over that peak and distract yourself just for those few minutes, then you're home free. That urge is going to fade whether you, um, whether you acted on the peak or not. And then the wise mind concept. Staying in wise mind means acknowledging that there's um, that cold rationality is not really the best place to be because it doesn't take into account your feelings or your spiritual life or um, uh, and there's always going to be a swing back into emotional reasoning if you're if you're really discounting that 
And then there's emotional reasoning, which is not a good place to make decisions from. It's just a tornado of want and reaction. Um, but balanced in there is a wise mind place where you're aware of your feelings and aware of the rational facts. And you're making a decision that's kind of balanced in awareness of that, but not controlled by either one. And then cognitive therapy. Um, this I've mostly already talked about the cognitive narrowing and interfering in that. Um, uh, challenging perfectionism, if somebody's trying to look perfect or get the perfect sweater or um, bring in a haul of you know, nine baskets of groceries without spending anything. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and then there's a concept called time affluence that's um, uh, coined by Tal Ben Shahar at Harvard who teaches a happiness class and has some happiness books out. Time affluence being um, having the time to spend doing what you want or spending it with the people you want. Um, as an alternative way to look at wealth instead of having all your time taken up with um, seeking out what's going on sale where or um, shopping online for bargains. And then there's the dynamic interventions, which are my favorite part. Um, once a person has control over their shopping, you want to really make it last, <laughs> right, and prevent relapses. And this is the part where um, they really get insight into why they got into this and what it means to them at a deeper level, why they're buying, what they're buying specifically. You know, what does it mean to outsmart the big guy at the store, finding the bargain? Or what does it mean to them, you know, to own a complete set of something? And then you can change this from a discussion about shopping and the objects they're buying to what that represents, you know, more deeply for them. Okay, in the complex clinical issues that come up, um, it's very difficult to quit a highly rewarding behavior, right? Everybody who treats addiction knows that. Um, you're trading a feeling of empowerment for a feeling of vulnerability. That's a hard sell. Um, you're working on relocating self-esteem from outer <coughs> things to inner sources, and that's long-term work. You're asking them to give up the idea of concrete proof of who they are, you know, based on what they wear and what they have. Um, and we live in a materialistic um, and heavy marketed society, so it's easy to get caught up in something like shopping addiction. Do we have time for questions? There's a couple questions. Any oh. questions? Two questions. Two questions. Two questions? Two questions? <laughs> okay. Um, the, uh, thank you for that excellent presentation, the process addiction. The new definition by the American Society of Addiction and Medicine contrasts the DSM-4 as an improved other behaviors that would improve the process addictions. Part of the reason we did it uh, with all the issues that you presented mm -hmm. and the fact that there is new brain evidence to support the process addictions. You touched very, very lightly on the brain scans. Uh, I don't know if here, or uh, in some other way you'd like to um, briefly summarize the uh, brain science behind uh, shopping addiction. I believe it's there, but it's mentioned much, much more publicized in gambling addiction, sex addiction, right. food addiction. Right, now, there has been research into that, and you might know um, a lot, you might know more about it too, um, since, um, that's an area of your specialty as well. But the, um, the brain doesn't differentiate. The reward center, dopamine reward center in our brain doesn't differentiate between um, drugs, dopamine released because of drugs or dopamine released because of experiences. That, that's what I wanted to, that's what ASAN said, is that they, they define it as the reward deficiency syndrome, dopamine squirts. Why? So it must be that DSM-4 goes on a different model, not a brain model, but a behavioral model, because the, um, the, the neurobiology supports your position, the non-differentiation of the primitive system. I, I appreciate you just comment on that. Yeah, um, yeah, it's a great, great question and a good topic. Um, I think one of the concerns um, with making shopping addiction a formal category in the DSM-4 is that 
almost anything can become a process addiction. And I think the worry is, you know, shopping can be, skateboarding can be, um, there's an online resource for people who are addicted, addicted to chapstick. You know, a lot of things can become process addictions. So um, where does it stop? And at what point do you have to say there's a more general um, thing going on here with people getting addicted to something, anything, um, because they find it hyper-stimulating? Um, there's a number of reasons, I think, um, especially from the neuromarketing research, <clears throat> that um, shopping in particular can become hyper-stimulating, um, more so than other things. But that research is not in the psychology field or in psychiatry field. That research is in marketing field. <laughs> so um, and there is a lot of brain science. Um, the neuromarketing uh, research uh, facilities are the ones that really cross over and use their, um, their MRI scanners to, to teach them about where, you know, how to, um, how to create desire in somebody, how to find out what lights up an individual person's reward center and how to match that with a product. There's a movie, I don't know if you saw it, it was out very briefly. I heard an interview, but I didn't get to see the movie, um, by Morgan Spurlock, who's the super size me guy. Um, but he made a movie called The Best Movie Ever Sold, which is about product placement and neuromarketing. And he went into um, a neuromarketing research lab in this movie um, and said, can you, can you make me want a Coke? <laughs> and he walked out of there, they put him in a brain scanner, they figured out what lights up his, um, his reward centers, they placed their product alongside, you know, and they, they did their tricks, uh, not all of which I'm familiar with, but he walked out of there, he said, with an unbelievable burning desire for Coke. Um, so they know how to trigger desire, they know how to create that. And um, he also said, um, in the last, I think it was in the last 007 movie, it was a $150 million production and $50 million of it was paid for by product placement, which means marketers who don't spend their money frivolously were wanting their products placed somewhere to create desire in people in that movie. And they're putting their money on it that that's going to work. So sort of a long-winded answer, and I didn't get into physiology very much, um, but there definitely is a science to it. There's a lot of information there. Um, I'd love to have more time to talk about that because it's a great, great topic. Yeah. Is there another question? Yeah. I just have one question on the acquisition of books. Um, <laughs> I've run across two kind of separate, separate, I've run across people who have, they see books that they know they need to read or they have to read them and they acquire them and they have stacks of these books. Then you find other people that have this enormous number of books stacked up, but they've actually read them. They are compulsive readers. They get these books and, and there's no place for them in their home. But they have all these books that they've read. Is there any difference in those two groups uh, uh, based on just the need to acquire books or people who just have to get this information and, and, and yet they, they manage to somehow work, work through it and find the time? to, to somehow consume all this information. and There's no room for these books. These are stacks of them all over the place. Right. The books thing, you know, I show that picture of books and I always get people saying, that's my basement or that's my house. Um, in fact, one of the people who used to organize my, my talks <coughs> said that she has a basement like that full of books. Um, it's, a, it's a good question. Is there a difference between people who actually read those books and people who collect books that they don't read? That they want to read. They that they, they want to read. read. Right, and or, or even the hoarders who are saving newspapers that they never got to, right? They've got newspapers backlogged for 10 years or more because there are articles in there that they think they might want to use. Um, so I think that the issue, I'm getting a time signal, so I'm just going to answer this one and stop. Um, I think the issue, at least for shopping and hoarding, is the saving of things. Like if they've read them, why do they need to keep them? Um, and if they're thinking that there's something valuable, so valuable that they need to have it, so they keep it, but they keep it in a state so that they won't ever really be able to find it when they need it. Um, then the question is, you know, do they trust their own um, gut instincts or ability to deal with whatever comes? Um, or are they, they feeling like they need to build up a, a stockpile or a, a fortress around them of things that, that can cope for them? So, thanks a lot.